Korua Pehu to Maunga, Ko Wanganui to Awa, Ko Wills to Fano, Ko Jolie Wills Aho. Uh, kia ora Toto. So um, I'm from New Zealand, Aotearoa. So in New Zealand, we are taught to really start with our ancestry and our Turanga Waiwai, our place that we stand. Thank you. The place that is our home in terms of our ancestors, our place, our belonging. So um, just for those here, that's, that's what I've done. So, you know, I was honoured to spend, I've been to Maui a couple of times during the, the wildfire um, recovery and there's something that feels very like home to me whenever I come to Maui. So for those in the room that will understand what that is about. So a couple of things to know about me. I'm a cognitive scientist, right? So that means that I'm really passionate about the psychology of disaster. Has anyone, you know, experienced fire brain? Yeah, a few nods. In my case, it was quake brain, right? So it's a very real thing. So the cognitive science piece has been really helpful in my disaster recovery and in the work that I do because after disaster, there is plenty of information that you have to absorb. There's plenty of decisions you've got to make. There's plenty of problems you've got to solve. And, you know, prolonged stress impacts our ability to do all of those things. Second thing to know is probably the most important thing, and, and Jen's touched on that. I am a disaster survivor myself. I have lived recovery firsthand in uh, my community with my family, um, and um, has since spent more than 10 years supporting other communities, other leaders who have been through something similar. And you can see why Jen and I get along um, so well. Huge um, proponent and supporter of After the Fire. So this session, we've, we've got sort of four areas that we like to support in Hamile. This one in particular is around the empowering communities with recovery knowledge. So when I think about the four ways that we can support as an organisation, you know, there are just when you see things playing out again and again after disaster, it's really tough, right? Like I'm a big believer that every disaster is unique, every community is unique. We have to hold that at the heart of everything that we do. But even within that, you start to see some common challenges, some common patterns playing out, some common strategies that are really helpful. And so I know, just like Jen experienced, you know, the weight of responsibility you feel as a recovery leader after disaster, trying to get it as right as you possibly can for your community. And I remember thinking just going about it blindly did not feel like the right way of doing it, right? I really wanted to learn and understand what others had learned, avoid some of those potholes, um, and, and pull together some of the lessons. So here's the four ways that we support. Um, how do we make it easier for leaders who carry so much weight after disaster? And I'm just gonna highlight this, we're not gonna cover this today, but if anyone um, is a free resource, please, if this is useful to you, reach out, I'll let you know how to get hold of one. Second one, really passionate about how do we sustain the supporters? And we're gonna have a session on that next. How do we really help recovery agencies, or organizations that are interacting with communities understand how to work well with disaster impacted communities so that they aid rather than inadvertently add stress to communities? And the one that we're gonna to cover today, how do we empower disaster affected people? Right. So I'm just gonna put a photograph up here. This is my event, right? This is when it all started for me. So September the 4th, 2010, we had a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. And I don't wanna spend long on this at all, I'm just gonna share a couple of numbers, and I know stats and numbers just don't really do justice to the lived experience, but just to give you um, just a quick context. So 7.1 magnitude earthquake, incredibly shallow, very close to our, um, our city. We had a population of 400,000, nine out of 10 homes damaged or destroyed. 75% of our horizontal infrastructure, so a huge rebuild process. 15,000 aftershocks, and you heard that right, 15,000 aftershocks over a period of five years. And one of those aftershocks claimed 185 lives. So just to give you a sense of just the scale that we were dealing with at the time. But you know, we always hear that recovery is a marathon, not a sprint, right? We always hear that. And it's very easy to focus on the bricks and the mortar. And I'm a big fan of focusing on the people, on the community, on everything that is so important. And so I just want to put a face to our experience when we talk about it being a marathon, not a sprint. These are my two kids. 
at the time of the Christchurch earthquakes. So um, in the middle, we, it's probably an hour or two after the initial earthquake. We had no electricity at that point. We're just sheltering in place. Um, we're trying to make a game of it, right? I promise I did not take a photograph of my kids in the middle of the event. There's a whole terrifying story I am not going to share today. But that is them um, sheltering in place, trying to make a game of it. The photograph on the left is my six-year-old helping to dig liquefaction. So liquefaction is, you know, when the ground liquefies every time there's a, a big quake and then dries into this horrible stuff that needs to be dug and leaves voids behind. But the photo that is most important, I want you to have a look on the right-hand side. This photograph here is a photograph of my kids when our house was finally repaired, right? So when we talk about it being a marathon and not a sprint, at this point they were way taller than me, not that that was hard, right? And you can see there's facial hair and everything going on there. So, you know, very, very different just in terms of um, you know, that photograph I put up of the initial, you know, earthquake, that as we all know, that's just the beginning of recovery. It's just the start, right? And between these two sets of photographs, there's a million decisions, a million challenges that, you know, I had to make, my family had to make, Fano, iwi had to make, our communities had to make as we reimagined our future. And so one of the things I thought about is like, how do we make this just a little bit easier when we are starting to see some of these common things playing out, communities grappling with some similar things again and again. And for me, it was this understanding that one of the reasons it is so hard is because at this stage, most people haven't been through a disaster and they don't have a sense of what's ahead and how to navigate their way through it, let alone how long it's going to be, right? And so thinking about, well, how can we put some of that recovery knowledge that we've learned from many, many different disasters into the hands of locals themselves? Because knowledge is power, right? And it's the locals, as we know, on the ground who do the hard work, the hard mahi, we would say in New Zealand. So they are the ones that are going to lead their family. They're the ones that are going to support their neighbours. They're the ones that are going to make informed decisions and advocate for their communities. So it was really important to us to gather some of that useful knowledge around recovery and make sure it goes into the hands of locals. And so that's where the Cards for Calamity came from. Initially we wrote a book, right? We started with writing a book and then I thought, I'm a cognitive scientist and I've lived disaster recovery. No one's got time to read a book, right? In the wake of disaster. So it got deconstructed into the Cards for Calamity. Today's session, I really want us to spend most of the time having a conversation. Right? So I'm going to ask you, I know I've got a lot of people outside, I'm going to ask you to come in and grab a seat at a table. And I'm also going to ask you, if you're sitting with people you know, I know this is scary, but I promise it's going to be worth it. If you're sitting with people you know, if you could just get up and move to a different table, not together as a group to a different table, to split up, be great. Because one of the best things about this conference, as Jen talks about, is we are bringing people together with incredible experience. Lots of locals who have experienced disaster recovery firsthand. And you know, there's nothing like locals in terms of what they know in terms of from disaster recovery. And there's nothing like the support of others who've been through something similar. Okay, the conversation's going to be really simple. It's really easy. We've got some instructions. Are you all ready? Okay, all ears this way. Right, on your table there's an envelope that has got some cards for calamity. Very random set of selection of cards. I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. I'm going to ask everybody to grab a card each out of that pack, just randomly. And what I want you to do is read your card aloud to the group. So I'm going to give you all the instructions at once and I'll come back. So everyone gets one card each. Once you've got one card each, what we will do in a second is we're going to read your cards aloud, right? Because everyone will have a different card. And then here's what we're going to do for the next about 25 minutes. I want you to each share the card that you heard that resonated with you and why. Does that make sense? And it's not even about the cards. It's about the conversation and the wealth of knowledge you have sitting at your table. They're just a way of sparking the conversation, right? So we're going to read the cards aloud to each other and then share which card you heard that resonated with you and why. And it's totally up to you how deep you go with that. It could be that one just surprised me, right? In terms of safety today, you can just share as much or as little as you like. But which card resonated with you and why? 
And I would encourage you, if you can, to share a story. Any questions for that? So we're going to read the cards aloud, and then we're going to share which card we heard that resonated with us and why, and hopefully share some stories. So we've got about 25 minutes. I'll just let you take it away. All right, so how was that? Meet some good people, some incredible experience here in this room, right? There's nothing like the experience of people who have been through something like yourself, right? People who kind of get it, who understand some of the challenges. All right, so on your table, there are some cards for calamity. Um, and I also have a set. These are for you to take away, thanks to the generosity of Good360. We've got Jim Alvey in the room here with his team. So a huge thank you to Jim. Yeah. And if anyone wants a Spanish set instead, please let me know. We do have them in Spanish also. Um, I just want to share, just so that you know what you've got um, with you there. There are 70 cards in the pack. Again, they are amazing for doing things like normalizing what people are going through. You know, people often say, gosh, someone somewhere else on the planet has gone through something similar. It's not just me. Right? There's something about people's shoulders coming down from around their ears when they realize they're not alone, right? They're also really good for sort of connecting people with some of those positive, hopeful strategies around the things that we know can be helpful. And lastly, one of the reasons I really love them is they're so good for connection and conversation because we know the fabric of a community, that's where you get your support from, right? The people around you. So I just wanted to share some ways in which they have been used um, because we kind of... We developed them thinking that they would be that private resource that someone would put on their bedside table or their coffee table or their bookshelf and they would kind of dip in and out of as they felt the need through their recovery. We wanted something that would be there through the long term. But what we didn't anticipate and we should have is how communities have used them, right? They've done really amazing things with them. So in Australia, you remember when it felt like the whole country was on fire, right? A couple of summers ago for them it was absolutely horrendous. And um, we partnered then to have the Cards for Calamity were distributed into every community that was impacted. And again, we thought they would just sit on people's shelves, right? But no, communities are amazing, as we know. We had a rugby club make a calendar out of their favourite 12, right? These are pretty burly blokes in, in Australia. There's something about being able to talk to a card. It's much easier, right? And then we had um, the local general store put a different card up every week on their notice board. We had a local radio station who would read a different card aloud and then open up the airways um, for people in the community to talk through their experience. And a couple of my favourite, one of the, the schools, there was a group of parents who dropped their kids off on a Friday and they turned up with their favourite card or the card that was resonating with them that week. And then they had a walk and talk, right, with the people together as a group. And the one that we call disastrous dinner with a difference is kind of what we've done here tonight. So one of the communities said, every month we're gonna have a barbecue because people have spread, right? Not everyone was able to stay. And so they have a reason to come back and reconnect, but also so, so that people can have a break from that relentless to-do list, right? And just hang out with each other and have a bit of fun. So every month they had a barbecue and they put under everybody's plate a different card for calamity so that you could start the conversation, right? Again, it's that social capital, those connections in the room that are so powerful for people's healing and the support to each other. So that's essentially what you've, you've just had an experience of. So these are cards you can take away and use in whatever way you find helpful. But Jim, I would like to hand to you, I know you are really a huge thank you to you for making sure these are available. I was gonna say huge fan, which, which I am and we are. Uh, at Good360, I don't want to talk long because you're, I don't want you to get sick of me. I'm up here a little bit later. Um, but when we met, uh, it was around the time that we went to Lahaina and met these wonderful people that are here who had been working at that time in December nonstop, every day, 24-7. Nicole's over there. I know she put stuff in her driveway, in her car. I was in that mobile warehouse. That went on and on and on. The response phase for this fire was the longest that we have ever seen. That first phase of just let's get started took a year. 
And that's too long for people to just stay on that 24 seven. So when we talked about it, it was like, this is something we need to make sure these guys are taking care of themselves. Um, are you? Kinda, sorta, okay. This is a reminder for all of you that have been working on this for so long uh, to do that. And so my team, and when I say we, I mean Peyton, Maddie, they do all the work. Um, but we said, this is something we wanna do. We wanna uh, support this on, on Lahaina. Uh, but also elsewhere. And if you guys can be disciples for this and kind of get it out there and start talking to people about taking care of yourself. Self-care is the only way that we can continue with long-term recovery. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. And I just want to finish with a story. Those of you who were here last year would have heard the story, so I apologize, but I know how important the story was for me. Right? It's, it's a question when we're talking about self-care, and it's a nice segue to the next session, which is going to be about sustaining yourselves as leaders in this space. But um, Jen mentioned I talked to over 100 recovery leaders around the globe, again, trying to work out how we went about it ourselves and making sure we could pay those lessons forward. And one of the leaders shared with me, she said, Jolie, and, and she's been part of my crew along the way. Like, I can tell you incredible stories around how she got me through some of the leadership work that was happening in Christchurch in um, Ototahi. So she said, I'm going to share a story with you because I think, you know, this would be helpful not just to you but to others who might be in a similar role. And she said when she very first went for her first job interview, right, so she was a social worker. So I went to my first professional job interview early in her career. And she said, and I turned up and I was really nervous, but I was really well prepared and I kind of was nailing it. She said, Jolie, I had all the answers to the questions. I was feeling really, really good. And then the hiring manager asked her a question she didn't quite know what to do with. And I said, well, what was that question? And she said, well, she said, Kate, I just want to know, are you a martyr? You know, there's enough R's in there that it's hard with my accent. Are you a martyr? I'm trying to put the R's in. Are you a martyr or are you a professional? And Kate sort of said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand. What do you mean? And she said, well, it's really simple. If you're a martyr, you're going to be the first one here. You're going to be the last one to leave. You'll fill every gap in my roster, right? There'll be very little barrier between home and, and you know, the, the role that you have here to play. And you're going to do amazing things. You will. But you're going to burn bright, and then you'll burn out. Not a lot of point in me investing in you professionally. She said, but on the other hand, if you are a professional, you will still care deeply about this mission. It'll still be really, really important to you but you will model some self-care practices, right? You'll put some boundaries in place. You'll sometimes say no when I need you to say yes, and you will endure, and the work that we are doing with this community will, will endure as a result. And together, we will do amazing things for this community. So which is it, Kate? Are you a martyr, or are you a professional? And Kate shared that story with me because she wanted me to share it on with you, but also because I think I needed to hear it at the time. So I know Brock said he was a recovery FEMA administrator, I like to say I'm a recovering martyr, right? So I just want to share that story because that question I keep in my back pocket and I check in with regularly to make sure I'm on the right side of that equation. Um, it's, you know, it's an evolving practice, right? And it takes practice. So am I a martyr or am I a professional? So thank you. I'm going to finish there because I want to give lots of time for our next session and we've got some fabulous speakers um, around sustaining ourselves as leaders in disaster recovery. So thank you for being good sports, right? Thank you to Jim Alvey and Good360 for the uh, cards for calamity that you can take away. Thanks very much. <laughs>